Good afternoon and uh, welcome to this presentation of a guide to private prosecutions. Um, I'm delighted to uh, be co-presenting with Anthony Metzer, Queen's Council, our Head of Chambers, and uh, we will be presenting a practical summary of the principles and process for pursuing a private uh, prosecution. Just a bit of background whilst we wait for the last uh, few people to uh, join. This is a topic which is of increasing relevance to criminal practitioners um, who may see more and more private prosecutions arising and also to civil and commercial um, litigators who uh, may want to consider a completely different strategy. So we hope that you enjoy this overview uh, of a guide to private prosecutions. It's intended to be a practical summary of the principles and process uh, for pursuing a private prosecution. And I'm now going to uh, hand over to Anthony Metzer. And good afternoon from me as well. And um, we would welcome participation from you. So if you, there's a Q&A below at the bottom. So if, after, if you have any questions, Adam and I will be very happy to look at after we've spoken. So that's the Q&A button at the bottom. Thank you. Um, so we're going to start with a definition. So the definition of, of private prosecution, a, a useful one to use, is the Fraud Advisory Panel from April 2013. Namely, a private prosecution is a criminal prosecution started by a private individual or body who is not acting on behalf of the police or any other prosecuting authority or body that conducts prosecutions. So we're looking at the fundamental right, first of all, uh, and it's probably worth noting that the, uh, the, uh, the right to private prosecution is not a new phenomenon. Um, and you can see that from Lord Wilberforce in the case of Gourier against Attorney General in 1978, when he said, this historical right, which goes right back to the earliest days of our legal system, remains a valuable constitutional safeguard against inertia or partiality on the part of authority. Uh, and we think this fundamental right is one that's unlikely to change because of its uh, inherent uh, value, as Lord Wilberforce puts it, uh, as to a constitutional safeguard. So we're looking at the background now to how uh, private prosecutions uh, came into being. Historically, as we've indicated, it's not new. All, private, private, all prosecutions were indeed private, but were brought in the name of the Crown. Back in the 19th century, they were brought by victims or relatives of uh, deceased victims. The, only, the Attorney General only instituted the most serious or notorious cases. In 1829, the Metropolitan Police Act enabled police forces, uh, which were established by that time, to bring prosecutions. Uh, and uh, that uh, moved to 1879 under the Prosecution of Offences Act, uh, by which there became the new role for the Director of Pro Public Prosecutions in respect of important and or difficult cases. Uh, and what we think is most interesting, as you can see from the 1985 Prosecution of Offences Act, is that uh, the CPS had been created, as you'll be aware, by uh, following a 1981 Royal Commission report on criminal procedure which had recommended the establishment of a statutory prosecution service with national coordination. So um, the CPS uh, became uh, involved in relation to private prosecutions under the Prosecution of Offences Act 1985. Uh, and you can see from that that before the CPS became involved, uh, it was individual police officers who brought a prosecution case. So in fact, although it was a named police officer, it's right to say effectively that all cases were in fact private prosecutions. Uh, and what has come since 1985 is that the CPS is now uh, the body that under the leadership of the DPP, uh, who has a duty to take over or instigate most prosecutions. The statutory force uh, is, comes from Section 6 of the Prosecution of Offenders Act 1985, which preserves the constitutional rights that we've set out before uh, and says, subject to subsection 2 below, uh, 
nothing in this part shall preclude any person from instituting any criminal proceedings or conducting any criminal proceedings to which the director's duty to take over the conduct of proceedings does not apply. And subsection two says, where criminal proceedings are instituted in circumstances in which the director is not under a duty to take over their conduct, he may nevertheless do so at any stage. The consequence of that is, and it's important to note, is that anyone can start a prosecution, but the DPP may take over or and pursue it or significantly can discontinue it. In reality, if the case is brought properly, the circumstances in which the CPS would discontinue a case would be rare, uh, but the defence will often choose to make an application. So if there is such an application made, uh, we think it's uh, prudent and advisable to obtain independence counsel's advice before uh, a decision is taken to pursue a prosecution, which creates a solid file to justify, if necessary, the decision to institute a prosecution. We're now dealing with the increase in private prosecutions, which is becoming more and more apparent. Uh, and you'll no doubt be aware from the media uh, and more generally, that local and national police priorities can mean that many cases are not pursued. That's often in areas of fraud, uh, but not necessarily limited to those areas. The, there's also been uh, a knock-on effect in relation to trial backlog during the COVID-19 pandemic. You'll probably be aware that the, uh, the backlog was origi originally before COVID-19 around 37,000 cases nationally in England and Wales, and has now risen to uh, what is now believed to be over 40,000. Uh, and uh, there are for, therefore increasing examples of private prosecutions where police and authorities become uh, overstretched. So we think uh, post COVID-19, it's likely that the police and CPS will choose which cases to prioritize and others will not be pursued. Uh, the current charging guidelines take into account the pandemic and the reduced availability of trials. And we shall make that clear uh, in the practice note, which we shall be supplying for you uh, early next week. But it's important to understand that many cases uh, will not be prioritized by the police. And therefore the possibility exists uh, that private prosecution may be the only route forward. Many organizations now routinely use private prosecutions. For example, FACT, the Federation Against Copyright Theft, Virgin Media, and British Phonographic Industry, the BPI. Uh, and we're going to set out some of the many advantages there are in bringing a private prosecution, which we uh, uh, maintain can be quicker, cheaper, and more effective than the alternative of a civil claim. So let's look at the core principles. Uh, the core principles are the ones contained within criminal law. The purpose is punishment. It's right to say the motive can also be important in relation to a decision to institute a prosecution. The burden and standard of proof are exactly what you'd expect in all criminal cases, burden of proof upon the prosecution to prove the case such that the jury, a jury or in the magistrate's court, if it was magistrate's court, uh, the magistrates or deputy judges, district judges, the standard of proof being such that they are sure of guilt, otherwise they do not convict. The evidence, as in the position uh, with, uh, with a, a CPS prosecution, is typically given live, the same protections that are there in relation to screens if necessary, um, and relation to witnesses. Uh, and of course, um, it's important to understand that the procedurally, uh, whether it's a private prosecution or one br taken, brought or taken over by the CPS uh, is very similar. The appearance of the accused uh, is required for the purposes of all pros private prosecutions. Uh, there are very limited circumstances in which the CPS can proceed with a prosecution without the accused present, uh, but for a private prosecution, the appearance of the accused is required. Uh, the outcomes, are twofold primarily. First, there can be a restraint order imposed. And secondly, the potential exists, this is a criminal case, of a conviction uh, with all the sentences available uh, to the court, including a custodial sentence, a fine, a confiscation order, and or a compensation order. 
In relation to costs, there are good prospects of a recovery from central funds, win, lose, or draw. Uh, and we make the point that uh, defense costs are generally not recoverable, uh, as opposed to prosecution costs. Uh, and the cost regime is one that's in the Crown Court cases, but will also cover the magistrate's court, uh, which is important because obviously that's where the case begins. Adam's going to develop that uh, very important uh, principle in relation to costs, because that can be seen as a prohibitive reason as not to not pursue a private prosecution for the reasons which we come to on the disadvantages. But it's important that you note that there are good prospects of recovery from central funds dependent upon the judge's decision, irrespective of the ultimate right and result at the end of the day. Uh, and uh, developing that point, there is no substantial risk of adverse cost order should the defence succeed uh, and the defendant is acquitted. And we now turn to, uh, to a, a particular cartoon, which uh, we think um, is apposite to the present situation. Now you can see that cartoon. Uh, it looks like the, the man in the cartoon uh, doesn't seem to understand what fiduciary means. We do make the point that this is actually quite a serious point in that matters you may feel are simply civil uh, are in fact, can in fact trigger criminal liability in a completely different approach. And although not in a, in a theft uh, situation, uh, Adam and I did appear recently in a case, a private prosecution, a case called JS and AT, um, being anonymized, uh, where uh, a defendant was alleged to have used coercive and controlling behavior in refusing to give a religious divorce under orthodox Jewish law with a background of domestic abuse. Uh, and that case uh, ended uh, successfully as far as the prosecution was concerned. Turning to the advantages, uh, these are just a summary of what are regarded as perhaps the most important advantages. First, the prosecutor may have a specialist knowledge, uh, and that is very useful because, for example, in a fraud type situation, uh, for example, or, or a coercive behavior case that Adam and I dealt with, which has particular knowledge of a, of a particular cultural background, uh, it gives you that cutting edge expert specialist knowledge. Secondly, uh, a greater control of the speed and the shape of the proceedings that the, the private prosecutor has much more control and Adam's going to touch upon that as to how the case develops uh, once it is instigated. Thirdly, it's a speedier and cheaper process than the alternative of civil proceedings. Fourthly, uh, and this was certainly apparent in the case that Adam and I prosecuted relatively recently, uh, it is more effective as a deterrent, certainly than civil proceedings, uh, and one has to recognise that one is looking at private prosecutions in circumstances where the, uh, the Crown, the CPS, are, haven't or are unlikely to take over the case or institute a prosecution. So that's why it is more effective as a deterrent, given the risk of the custody and other type sentence and the uh, opprobrium that comes with that, than the alternative of civil proceedings. Uh, for the reasons that Adam will develop, as I've indicated, there's a good chance of recovery of costs under Section 17 of the Prosecution of Offences Act 1985. And in addition to the, uh, the possibility of recovering costs uh, and or uh, a verdict, successful verdict, which could result uh, in uh, various uh, criminal sanctions, there's a possibility of a restraint and compensation order as well as confiscation. Um, you may remember this, uh, this advert about Heineken. Certainly some of us are old enough to remember it. Uh, and um, we uh, note that, that the great advantage, we, one of the great advantages we see of, of a, a, a private prosecution, for example, in the fraud context, is it genuinely does refresh the parts that other prosecutions cannot reach. You can see there the figures in relation to the prosecution of white collar crime falling by 30% since 2014, and that's been reported in the Times last year, uh, and that fraud accounts for a third of, a third of crime, but just 2% of cases are prosecuted by fewer than 1% of the police. And that comes uh, from the BBC from earlier this year in January. So that's a good example for where private prosecution absolutely fills, potentially fills a vacuum. <laughs> 
Finally, from my part, as far as disadvantages are concerned, and thankfully they are few. First, as I've already indicated, the CPS may take over private prosecutions and discontinue the case, and that comes under uh, a combination of sections, subsection 6.2 and 23 of the Prosecution of Offenders Act 1985. Uh, secondly, um, and importantly, investigators are un unable to apply for search warrants by contrast to Section 8 of the Police and Criminal Evidence Act, which refers expressly to a police officer. Although in a recent case of Virgin Me Media and Zinger, Zinger, which is refer referenced in the practice notes, what uh, happened in that case is the private prosecutor used the police to execute uh, the warrants, and therefore uh, there is a way round this potential disadvantage. Uh, and with, uh, with that last observation, I now hand over to Adam, uh, who will deal, take things further. Uh, uh, can I just uh, remind you, uh, in doing that and bringing him into the discussion, particularly in relation to the question of cost, but not just to do with that, is that the prosecutor has to be prepared to fund the investigation and the prosecution and the potential risk if no cost order are made under Section 17. But as I say, Adam will develop that point and perhaps minimise the concerns in that regard shortly. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Tony. That's very helpful. Um, I put up a picture here, which is one that's uh, quite familiar to us. Um, Nigella Lawson, the celebrity chef, and the prosecution of the Grillo sisters, many will remember, following a police complaint of fraud. Um, I've been warned about using too many kitchen puns, like the evidence being overbaked or cooking up a storm, but uh, Nigella Lawson, you will remember, was uh, comprehensively and expertly cross-examined about her private life, and ultimately the defendants were, uh, committed, were acquitted. Rather, uh, Defence counsel was our very own Anthony Metzer, who we've just been hearing from, uh, but it is, you may think, a good example of a case where the complainant completely lost control of the proceedings. As a public prosecution, uh, Nigella had no control and was unable to stop the proceedings, and she got caught up in, a, in an undesired prosecution and exposure of some less savoury ingredients of her uh, private life. And of course, that all came out because of uh, Tony's cross-examination of her. The point being, had this been a private prosecution, um, the outcome might have been very different in the sense that um, as soon as things began to get unsavoury, the plug could have been pulled on that. Uh, she wouldn't have been forced to uh, engage in the way that she had to uh, as, as a witness. Um, turning to the investigation, um, the one should consider perhaps at the beginning of an investigation, a PACE compliant interview letter or invite a defendant to a voluntary interview. Of course, we don't have the same powers as a private prosecutor of the police of arrest and compelling an interview, but it can be a very powerful start to a case to uh, get someone along and uh, make sure that they uh, have the opportunity to give their account. Um, I'm going to say something about Norwich pharmacal orders. Um, those are civil practitioners will be perhaps more familiar with them than criminal practitioners, but um, for third party disclosure of information, um, pre-action against a, a potential defendant or in fact um, against any uh, other third party who's been mixed up um, in the proceedings, um, they can be a useful application to make uh, and the authority there is authority for the fact that they can be used to get third party disclosure pre-action in a criminal case. Um, one can secure a witness summons to secure production of documents. That's, of course, after a summons has been um, created, so um, not uh, pre-action. And also, uh, one can seek assistance of the police for international inquiries and sharing of any financial reward. Somewhat more unusual, but um, that has happened. We are, we've been asked a question about the funding of, um, of that compensation orders, um, and it's right to say that in the Virgin uh, Media case, it's right that the uh, police were involved in the initial arrests and warrants and in uh, Virgin Media, the um, uh, confiscation proceedings took place. And in fact, proceedings were sh the proceeds of the crimes were shared back with the complainant. So it is possible um, for all of those uh, remedies to be borne in mind and restraint obviously comes at a very early stage. Again, 
good, uh, good idea to seek counsel's advice as soon as um, there's a reasonable suspicion of an offence to ensure that independent review and compliance with the criminal procedure rules. Um, in terms of disclosure, the criminal standard applies. It's more extensive than civil cases. If evidence might reasonably be considered capable of undermining the case for the prosecution against the accused or of assisting the case for the accused, the uh, matters must be disclosed. One must bear in mind that the prosecutor is acting uh, in, with, with the utmost good faith and is an officer of the court. There is that duty of candor that comes uh, with anyone who appears before the court. One can't play fast and loose in a private prosecution, certainly. It requires great care to safeguard the integrity um, of the process. Um, Lemons to Justices ex parte Aston Manor Brewery is a case in point where a successful abuse was run because the defence argued quite rightly that the prosecutor in a civil case uh, which was being brought also decided to take a parallel and uh, similar private prosecution at the same time and there were all sorts of problems with overlapping disclosure responsibilities and whether the victim was effectively um, in control of the uh, disclosure process and using it to help with the, with the civil case. So one must be scrupulously uh, careful when taking a private prosecution. Um, there is always the danger that, that um, disclosure could trespass on matters of uh, privilege. So one has to be very, very careful, um, with, particularly when discussing whether a private uh, prosecution is going to take place or, or the merits. Um, it's very, very helpful to have um, that discussion uh, with care, knowing sort of later down the line, um, those sorts of discussions and those may be disclosable. Um, the threshold test is the same as in a public prosecution. One must consider whether the case meets the full code test for Crown Court prosecutors. That is sufficient evidence for a realistic prospect of, con of conviction. And also, is it in the public interest to pursue the prosecution? That doesn't mean it doesn't have to be uh, personal to the uh, complainant, but it does have to be uh, something which is a crime rather than just a, a, a civil wrong. There is a very useful guide which we'll put in the practice notes from the Crown Prosecution Service of where business interests might overlap in, and stray into fraud in particular, where there may be overlapping uh, civil wrongs and criminal wrongs. If um, you are not, um, if the uh, court is not um, satisfied, um, sorry, rather, if the, uh, um, those tests are not satisfied, rather, um, there is a risk of the defence inviting the CPS to take over or discontinue the case, as uh, Tony has mentioned, and certainly that's the case if it's a frivolous or vexatious exercise, there is a risk of an adverse cost order. But that is quite rare if it's done properly and proper advice is taken. Um, one should always seek an independent uh, review, um, and it's a good idea to have on record counsel's advice on the merits of a private prosecution. Restraint, confiscation and compensation. And again, um, we had a, question, a couple of questions on this. Um, there is the opportunity at the beginning of a case to have an ex parte restraint order under the Proceeds of Crime Act 2002. Proceedings for an offence have to have been started. So that means you have to have lodged your summons or laid your information, if you like. Um, and there is reasonable cause to believe that the defendant has benefited from his criminal conduct. In fact, Tony and I were both involved in a case where simultaneously the summons was obtained at the magistrate's court and we were waiting in the Crown Court to make that application for a worldwide restraining order, which of course was free, as opposed to the massive costs that that would have um, um, caused uh, any person making that application if it was done in the High Court. Um, proceedings start when the summons is issued, as I've said, and the grant of a restraint order is discretionary. You need to show a real risk of dissipation. But the good thing is that there is no indemnity or undertaking if you've got that wrong. It's the court's decision. If the court forms the view that there is a reasonable risk, um, generally speaking, you'll get your restraint order, assets will be frozen, and then they'll be sorted out at the end of the case with confiscation. On conviction, um, we, I mentioned the uh, Virgin Media case, um, and that confirmed that this is available, confiscation orders are available in private prosecutions under Section 6 of the Proceeds of Crime Act. The idea is to deprive the defendant of the benefit from criminal conduct, and um, 
um, and that has happened and compensation has been made out of those restrained funds and out of a confiscation order. The draconian rules act as a forceful deterrent. The largest confiscation order to date in a private prosecution, or in the case that I've noted there, Ketan uh, Samir and the Crown, this is one of prosecution by Merli Machandani in 2017, the defendant who was styled King Kong by the Daily Mail was ordered to pay 36.8 million um, back to Jute investors and the judge notably called him a formidable and serial fraudsman on a truly Olympian scale. So it clearly is possible for private prosecutors to avail themselves of those draconian uh, rules that apply to all defendants facing um, proceeds of crime proceedings. Compensation um, can also be um, applied for on its own, in its own right, under Section 130 to 134 of the Powers of Criminal Courts Sentencing Act 2000, and there's no limit. It's obviously subject to a defendant's means. Coming on to cost, which is a very important part of our uh, presentation, and I find absolutely fascinating because of the disparity between the defence and the prosecution, a private prosecutor can recover costs from central funds under Section 17 of the 1985 Prosecution of Offences Act, irrespective of the outcome. And that is a central funds application. It's not an application against the other side. And of course, the notable difference between uh, these private prosecutions and civil proceedings is we're not looking at um, the outcome. It's simply recompense for bringing the prosecution. So if it's properly bought, brought, the court will order um, um, a refund of reasonable prosecution costs. The court may order payment out of central funds of such amount as the court considers reasonably sufficient to compensate the prosecutor for any expenses properly incurred by him in the proceedings. And paragraph 2.6.1 of the practice direction, costs in criminal proceedings, um, great bedtime reading, says that the presumption in favor of an order um, is that it should be made, save where there's good reasons for not doing so. So it's more that somebody has to suggest that there's a reason for not making a cost order rather than you arguing that um, there should be. So the general rule is that once you get to the Crown Court, um, a cost order should be made and it would be made against not only the Crown Court proceedings, but also all the proceedings that went before the Magistrates Court and so on. Unfortunately, it's not, it, notably, it doesn't cover cases which are only magistrates court only. So if you don't get to the ground court, you can't avail yourself of this particular um, provision. There is a degree of caution which remains advisable in all these sorts of cases. The court will potentially consider terms of engagement with solicitors and advocates and the steps taken to involve the state prosecuting authorities. So those are all factors not essential to notify the police, um, but often in fraud cases, it's a good idea to um, lodge a crime report. Of course, nothing will happen with it and then go on and say, well, we, we, we tried, the police weren't interested and so on. So um, we think that private prosecutions represent a really interesting um, and um, novel way of dealing particularly with fraud cases, but also as Tony has mentioned, could be uh, other sorts of cases, domestic violence and so on, where the police and the prosecution, um, the, the, the um, public prosecutors have not been interested. Um, we're happy, we're, we're gonna deal with quite a lot in um, a practice notes, which we will supply afterwards and try and answer all of your questions that have been coming up in those notes as well. Um, but I'll turn back to Tony and we'll try and answer um, some of the main questions that you've put forward today. Thank you, Tony. Thank you, Adam. That's really helpful. Um, I'm going to try and answer uh, some of the questions. Some I think have been answered already, and I might pass one or two to Adam as well. Uh, the first question I think has been answered, which is about uh, the situation in relation to confiscation and proceeds of crime. Um, I think uh, you've heard from Adam now uh, that he has covered it in relation to uh, how it's done procedurally. Uh, and as far as funds, are, uh, the, the recovery of funds are concerned, you've heard in circumstances how that is distributed uh, in relation to victim or victims as to how that is achieved. Um, the, other, the next question is, I think questions two and three are, are, are connected really, uh, and I'm going to try and answer those. Um, 
uh, where cases are uh, taken over by the CPS and then dropped, essentially, which I take as meaning by uh, not pursued. And I note in the third question, there's a question about uh, where um, there's enough evidence that the uh, case should, should be proceeded with. Uh, the answer is, uh, it is open to the victim or, or family of the victim to pursue a, uh, re has a right to review by, which, by, by way of judicial review. So you can judicially review a decision of the CPS uh, in relation to a case that's been dropped uh, and or uh, argue the sort of points that Mr. Bryce puts in his uh, question uh, that uh, if there's a proper argument to argue on judicial review grounds, applying that test. But as you'll appreciate, the judicial review test is a high threshold. And the significance, importance to note behind that is that even that there is a remedy in relation to potentially JR, there is no possibility for the private prosecution to be reinstigated once the CPS has, has taken over the case. Um, Adam, I'm going to suggest you answer the last question, which has come from uh, Alan Robertshaw, uh, in relation to uh, the uh, whether adverse inference can be drawn from a defend, prospective defendant refusing to attend a paid interview. Yes. Um, so the answer is no, is the short answer. Um, you can invite a defendant to attend a pay style interview and they can decline. Um, what we oft, what I often put in the draft is that the decision as to whether the prosecution will be commenced or not may depend on the outcome of the information you supply. So I think it's good practice to give people an opportunity to account for themselves. And of course, if they do say something, um, that can be part and parcel of the of the evidence. But what what it doesn't um, um, trigger is the same sort of adverse inferences that we used to in the criminal courts, because effectively it's a voluntary interview and it has the same status and it's the same uh, thing that applies if anyone's practiced um, in sort of social security prosecutions or local authority prosecutions where there's a sort of DSS um, interview or people are invited for interview, something like that. Um, that's the same sort of thing that has applied there, um, that there's, there's, there's not an adverse inference as such, but the um, certainly what they do say, um, certainly if it's in, in incriminating or, or, or otherwise, can be put before the court. Thank you, Adam. Uh, the last question has come from our colleague uh, Dominic Bell to ask, and I'm, I'm going to start answering that. Adam, you may want to add to this. Um, and perhaps we should say a word about disclosure in terms of a disclosure officer being an independent disclosure officer um, I mean there are issues about uh, 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 there are proper safe procedural safeguards in relation to disclosure uh, but I think the short answer to your question are you entitled to are you entitled to look at the file if the police uh, have some investigation as a prosecutor you are but um, Adam may just add a, a word or two particularly in relation to protections involving a disclosure officer which is connected in some regard to that question well, I think it goes two ways. First of all, it's the information that one gets as a prosecutor. Can one get a police file? Very commonly in the cases that I've done, we have requested from the police and we've obtained, uh, you might need a, an order for it, but we've obtained the information that the police had. And often uh, you'll see that it's not very good. I had a recent case where the um, it was a uh, contractual dispute, but it was actually um, veered into fraud and um, the contractor concerned who was party to the fraud had been asked to give um, a statement to the police, had refused. And in fact, what happened is we ended up um, putting him in as a defendant. So the police were not willing to take the case because they felt that this was, um, they didn't have enough evidence. This person wasn't willing to come forward um, when he was actually um, served a summons and he was a defendant as part of a conspiracy. Of course, he had to give his account and he ended up pleading guilty. So that just shows how the police can get it wrong. It also works in the other way around in terms of the information we have to give. And the general practice is we will um, use somebody who's experienced at um, dealing with disclosure in chambers, often not the advocate in the case, but maybe a junior or a pupil can act effectively as disclosure officer. And quite rightly, they serve the same MG6C, the same schedule of unused material that we're used to seeing when you're on the other side of a, of a public prosecution. So no difference in the disclosure rules. Um, the only difference is it's not normally a police officer. It's normally, you know, a, a junior member of chambers or it can be solicitors who deal with that. And it's normally done properly when we do it. Yes. So I think, um, Dominic's other question, I think you've answered, Adam, which is the answer is yes, the obligations in terms of disclosure are precisely the same 
uh, as they would be in relation to uh, CPS prosecution. Um, there's been one quick last question. Um, I think there might actually be a quick answer to this, but I'm going to suggest Adam answer it. Uh, does RIPA apply to private prosecutors? Um, well, the answer, the answer is it does. Um, it, it applies to um, anyone bringing a, a, a private prosecution. I think it would have been a quick and easy way round um, the, uh, the, the restrictions on the repo if the security forces or other people just brought private prosecution as opposed to a, a, a public one. Um, not entirely sure what particular um, restrictions um, or, or otherwise um, are, are referred to in the question, but certainly, um, yes, private prosecutors are um, under the same sort of rules um, of, of REPA. And um, although, the, although somebody investigating a private prosecution isn't charged with, um, in the same way, and doesn't have a sort of public authority charge um, of for, um, duty to, to, to bring a prosecution, certainly once you do and you enter that arena, and the same rules apply to a private prosecutor as to anyone else. Thank you, Adam. Well, I think that's completed all the, oh, I'm just seeing, I, uh, there's one more question, uh, which is uh, a question about, um, about private prosecutions based on undercover animal rights investigations. Uh, I don't sure that's a question, but that, that, that's very much the sort of case that's perfect for a private prosecution, uh, given the, um, uh, the probable lack of interest as far as the, uh, the CPS will be concerned. So the answer to your question, Alan, is absolutely um, these are the sort of cases which are, are, are dearly primed for private prosecutions, we think. Um, uh, so I think that's all the questions. We, we, uh, as I say that, more questions are coming up. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I think um, there's a question about the uh, last one we're going to answer then. Has the GDPR, does it have any relevance? Um, again, I think the short answer to that is yes. Uh, but there's probably a longer answer that can be given and Dominic will be happy to discuss that with you in due course. Um, I think we're going to wrap up on the questions and we're very grateful for the questions that have been asked. Um, if you do have any further questions, please don't hesitate to get in touch through our senior clerk, uh, John Francis. Uh, Adam and I will be delighted to answer any further questions. I think there's a, a short questionnaire in relation to this webinar, which I think you'll be asked to answer if you don't mind. Uh, we very much enjoyed being with you this afternoon. Can we thank you very much for your attendance? And we look forward to uh, hearing from you in due course. Thank you very much. We're going to uh, now end this webinar. Thank you and bye-bye. Bye-bye.